Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor. I've got a lot of good information today. A lot of I've seen a lot of really interesting tweets and different things going on. But what I wanted to start, and I also am going to talk about Tiger Woods winning the Masters, but I want to make a larger point with that. So I'm going to do that at the end of my video. But first, this is a tweet sent from Anthony Pompliano, who I like. I think he's a great guy. Um, I do think that he's a little off the mark with Bitcoin and the Satoshi Nakamoto thing. He says... We are better off never knowing who Satoshi Nakamoto is. Well, I think that that might be the case uh, because if he if he did show up, then all of the things that the Bitcoin people have said about about Ripple, all of a sudden they've got a lot of those same same problems on their hand. But they have a bigger problem, which is what I point out to him in the when I'm, in my reply to his tweet. If let's say you do find out. Uh, you, I said you may need to ask he or she to escrow most of their holdings like the way Ripple did because they control a lot of Bitcoin supply. And then I said, I wonder if you can trust Satoshi to do so. And I was making a point there, and the point is very obvious, and that is that we know who the people that at Ripple that own a lot of XRP are. We know who they are. We know that they've been completely above board with what they were going to do with it. We know that they legally escrowed it, and so that, and they and they gave us a schedule of how they will release it and if they will release it and how that will all work. That was all done, folks. Satoshi Nakamoto. Nobody knows if it's a girl, a boy, a government, a company, um, a the mafia. Nobody knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is, and so they're in a situation. Whether they find out or don't find out, you've got a mysterious person that controls, person or entity, that controls a large percentage of all of the Bitcoin supply. And that's a scary thing if you really think about it. But let's say he came out tomorrow. What do you do then? Do you say, well, what are you? Then it becomes a big, huge issue where people start saying, well, what are you going to do with your, with your, how do we know you're not going to dump it? That's what they hit. That's what all of them were hitting Ripple with about their XRP holdings uh, a few years back. So what happens then? What happens to the value while that discussion is going on? That is a huge problem, a huge problem when the when the creator of, of a digital asset is not known. And so I haven't seen an answer to this because you can't really answer this because it, to answer it acknowledges the huge problem that's right there. It is like literally in the middle of the room, an elephant in the room. Okay, next. Um, now, this is, I couldn't tell. It says that this article is on April 14th, but it, it seems kind of like old news, but I was going to read you one section of this anyway. Bank America of America anticipated to join the crypto scene, and they were saying that CNN was saying all of this. And so um, I just wanted to read this part to you. Des despite uh, this lack of daily use, Bank of America is working to get into the crypto space. They're working on creating a cryptocurrency aggregation system that would put these deposits in an enterprise account which protects the funds through vaults and offline storage. CNN reports that the patent, which is Bank of America's patent, uh, states that deposit accounts at an enterprise such as a financial institution are used by customers of the financial institution to deposit funds for safekeeping. Well, I just wanted to read you this just to... Uh, these guys aren't going anywhere. Where, where this is going is the bank, whether it's Bank of America or any bank, they either they either take uh, digital assets on deposit or they die, period. So they're going to be holding digital assets. Initially, it may be digital assets sitting beside your dollars or your euro in a bank account. But eventually, the euros and the dollars are going to go away and it's just going to be digital assets. And if they don't do that, they won't be a bank anymore. Simple as that. Christine Lagarde said it herself. Okay. <laughs> now, folks, let me tell you this. I, I, if anybody out there, this is from Abacus Journal. It's a, he said, they say, someone please crypto meme, meme this. 
please, I am on board with Advocacy Journal. This is one of the funniest things that I have seen in quite a while, folks. And I want you all, this is from uh, Ian Miles Cheong at Still Gray is who posted this. What this is, this is a this is a guy who is watching what I guess is the trailer to the final Star Wars movie. And let me tell you what, it's one of the funniest things that you are going to see probably in the last year online uh, because the guy is so into it. He literally starts crying. He's so into Star Wars and this thing. Well, I'm on with Abacus Journal here. I want to see some of you talented people turn this video into a, in the, the meme of this into something having to do with XRP. That would be awesome. This is made for something like that. Let's turn this... If someone out there is good enough and can turn this video into something great, I will feature you all day long. Give me something I can show because I think it's made to uh, to have something really funny. And I think it'll go viral if you do it. So, and I'll help you make it viral. All right, moving along. Um, and it's so funny. I laughed. I showed it to my wife a minute ago and laughed. Okay. This is from Bob in the XRP, and he uh, sent me this. Which continent will be the home for the most? Which continent will be the home for for most of the important and powerful crypto companies in ten years? Why? Which countries retweet to get a good sample size? I think that Asia is a pretty good bet. Korea has been driving crypto uh, for the last few years, and they keep. You know, but it's like regulatory people just keep uh, becoming a problem. Every time there's a bull run, all of a sudden the regulatory people, oh, we're, we're not so sure about this. I'm sure it, there's a lot of market manipulation that's going on over there. But I think this is, but I do think, here's what I do believe. I think that, that North America, specifically the United States, is eventually going to going to surprise this industry. I don't know what the thinking is as to why they're dragging their feet. But I think that the U.S. one day will step up to the plate on this. But it's interesting to show anyway. Um, next from Philip Nunn. Let me, I'm going to have some more of my apple cider vinegar here. From Philip Nunn. In the aftermath of last year's bear market, which saw Bitcoin price plummet from near 20000 all-time high to 3200 in December, Bitcoin markets are now starting to set record volumes. And so we're starting to see... These were the these are the uh, the volumes from back when um, if you, you can see down down here it shows you the months that's back from the last run the volumes look like this and now the volumes on April third got up like they were and so should be interesting and you should also take note look how the volumes have dropped back down here and look how during that during the bull run that we had little situations where the volumes went back down then too. So this is not an uncommon thing. All right. Um, and next, let me get rid of a couple of things here. Uh, next from CCN, one Bitcoin could exceed $1 million in seven to 10 years. And that's from the PayPal in seven to 10 years. That's from the PayPal director. So I'm, I, that speaks for itself, too. I'm not going to go in, into the article or anything. I just wanted you to see that. You got somebody else throwing out big numbers like that for what they think Bitcoin is going to do. Then, also, I'm not going into this whole thing. More than half of all companies will use blockchain tech in three years, says Oracle Vice President. That speaks for itself also. And they're already working with, I, I think it said like a hundred cu customers on this now. Max Kaiser, who I totally agree with on his economic analysis, but he's a Bitcoin guy. He's anti XRP because I don't think he totally gets the big picture. I was telling someone it when I was messaging back and forth with him the other day, and I've told people on this channel before, but I'll repeat it. I first had my I first invested in Bitcoin, but like many of you, I eventually found XRP, and it was obviously the one where a bunch of professional, smart, and connected people had gotten together to take the concept of Bitcoin to the next level, and with a with a simple concept that. And I've told you this before. If I had gotten into digital assets when I was 18, I may have stopped at Bitcoin because. 
I like the, uh, there's a lot of people that have a lot of reasons to be anti-government. And, and I believe that that's what the Bitcoin movement was born of. And I, and I agree with a lot of that. But when I saw at, at age 44, when I, or actually it was not 44 when I started this, it was more like 40 or so, but, or maybe before that. But anyway, you get the picture. When, as an older man who's been through a lot of things and seen a lot and seen the economic ups and downs of the world and how things work and been with a, a large Wall Street firm, I see things a little different than I did when I was younger. And I think I thought then and I think now that the way that Ripple went about this to go to, to the regulatory agencies right out of the gate and to go to the central banks and have conversations from way back, you know, five, six years ago to have created that dialogue instead of trying to be some kind of anarchist cryptocurrency was the right way to go. And I think you're seeing that now because you, you don't see Christine Lagarde holding up Ripple and XR, holding up Bitcoin. You see them talking about her. You see her talking about Ripple and XRP. And that's because they went about it the right way. Just like my gut told me back then, and tells me now that's the reason that I disagree with Max Kaiser on this because he's he's still a, a major anti-government anti-central bank. Hey, I'm with you, Max. I just think that that I think that it was gone about the correct way with XRP because they knew if they went about it the same Bitcoin route, they would not achieve near as much. That's what I think. But Max Kaiser believes Bitcoin will become the next reserve currency. I disagree with him. I think XRP will before Bitcoin will for many of the reasons I just said. And I'm going to show you something in a minute for, from Love for Crypto that addresses this also. Folks, look at this and look at it very closely because remember, you go to your bank here in the United States, you're, you're lucky if you get one and a half percent on uh, in interest on anything. You're lucky. I'm seeing interest rates as high as five to nine percent that people are earning in crypto right now. And I don't even trust it yet. But when places like Coinbase start doing this, folks, this is from Co Coinbase Custody. Coinbase Custody CEO recently chatted with Laura Shen on unconfirmed discussing how, how Coinbase Custody's new staking service can help investors for the first time realize yield on assets securely secured safely offline. Listen here. So Coinbase is about to get in the game of paying you interest on your digital assets, folks. Now these guys are legit. Okay. These guys are, are probably going public sometime soon. This is the real deal. It starts to become real when you start seeing people earning interest on their cryptocurrency. The next phase, you're gonna, next thing you're going to see is you're going to start seeing people being able to use their, their digital currencies at, to get loans from banks and things like that. And it's going to be new neo banks and stuff like that. And then eventually it's going to be traditional banks or they'll die. Like we keep saying next, um, and this is from Proppy, And I thought this was interesting. And I was going to show you what Proppy is because I've talked about things like this before. Let's try again. Let's try again out of the top four coins on the market right now, which one, are you most likely to use to buy a property in the future? Oh, do you know how excited I would be to be able to buy a, a uh, beach house with my XRP one day? That would be cool. And I may be doing it through Proppy. Who knows? But I wanted to show you who Proppy is. I've talked about this. I, I've talked about real estate and how I believe blockchain will change the closing process more than anything else. I believe this could be one of the bigger uses for blockchain in the history of blockchain. What Proppy is doing is they are trying to simplify and shorten the closing process. Invitations, purchase agreement, deposit payment, title report, disclosures, settlement statements, payments, closing documents, ownership transfer. They're trying to transfer ownership on a blockchain, folks. And guess what you pay in? You can pay in crypto, buyer, seller, Look at this, folks. This is going to change everything. If I was a close, real estate closing attorney, I would be paying attention very closely to this. Or a real estate agent. You can go to their website at proppy.com, P-R-O-P-Y.com, 
And if I could figure out if 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 these guys, I would love to um, find out if these guys have any kind of program where you can help them get the word out on this, and um, and if they if they pay a commission or something because this is is going to be huge business right here, folks, huge. All right, and finally, I wanted to show you this from Love for Crypto. And those of you that don't know him, go follow him at Love for Crypto Seventeen. And he also has a YouTube channel, and he's a good guy. I've talked to him a few times. He, he's just go Love for Crypto on YouTube, and you can, and subscribe to his channel. Now he says one. Now I'm not saying that I agree or disagree with these things, but I do think this guy's really smart, and he's done a lot of study. He's got some good videos that he can show you that with, and whether whether I agree with this stuff or not, I sure hope he's right. <laughs> I'll say that because the first thing he says here is XRP becomes the global reserve currency, removing the U.S. petrodollar status. Number two is what I thought was the most interesting thing he said. Ripple's 55 billion XRP escrow or a large percentage will be signed over to the IMF World Bank. Now, folks, I keep telling you something is going on with the IMF and they, Christine Lagarde keeps on talking about Ripple and XRP and how, how crypto is going to disrupt the world. Well, there's one other thing and, and I'll go ahead and read his third thing and then I'll go over this. XRP becomes the global standard for the exchange of value via the IOV Web.3 W3C. Well, there's one other thing. In line with this, this number two really intrigues me. I think that he, I think that there is a possibility that the guy could be seriously on to something here. Um, but there's one thing, and I can't. Ooh, let me think if I, if I can remember the name of the company. Ripple is partnered with. This is a company that is using uh, at least RippleNet and maybe XRapid. I can't remember on the XRapid, but they are owned mostly by the World Bank. That's just another tie-in to all of this. But I want to read number two to you again, because this is a very interesting statement. Ripple's 55 billion XRP escrow, or a large percentage, will be signed over to the IMF World Bank. If something like that ever happens, folks, you and I can just go ahead and retire in style, because it is game over, folks. Game over, big time. Game over. Or maybe game, set, match. All right. Well, thanks to Love for Crypto for that. Very interesting. Next, I wanted to give this guy, hey, if you're going to tattoo XRP on your arm, I'm going to show it on my channel because you are a true believer and I respect you. <laughs> um, look at this. I don't have any tattoos, but this guy has got an XRP tattoo. Wow. <laughs> Looks like it hurts. Um, I've always heard that getting tattoos does hurt. Um, okay, and next to Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods, for those of you that don't know, he won the Masters today. Um, and this uh, was this picture was going around. And I wanted to show it to you. This is Tiger Woods, I believe, when he won his first Masters, and he's hugging his dad. And this is Tiger now hugging his son. And so, but what I wanted to talk about having to do with Tiger Woods. Um, this really hits home for me because part of the reason that I do what I've done with my sons, I started, I started my son at age five hitting baseballs and we've hit baseballs year round three times a week since he turned five and the other at seven. Well, when I see Tiger Woods and I see him uh, achieving this and I see his dad, this is, this is, this is what it's all about to me is this guy taught his son what is it what was involved he saw he taught his son is what was involved in achievement achievement of anything on a large scale and what's interesting about what's happened with tiger woods is over the course and maybe i can't remember if it was in conjunction with his dad dying but the guy lost his way he i think that tiger woods uh, not only did he go through many injuries, back injuries and back surgeries and all this, but I think that Tiger Woods also got caught up in the fame of things and he, and he got caught up in a lot of the, the things. And Tiger Woods is a good lesson to us all. Uh, and I think Mike Tyson experienced a lot of the same thing once he achieved that status, that he what he had always worked for. And then he finally had it 
And it was almost like he got bored and started doing all the things that end up, ended up finally bringing him down. Well, to see Tiger Woods go through that same thing, but then to rebound and come back, that's a great story, folks. But what I'm most interested in is, is what Tiger did to get there. And this is what you should be interested in, especially you young people out there. What you should be interested in is, is what did this guy have to do? What was the dedication level? What did this guy have to do? And how, how many times did he have to go hit golf balls while all his friends were going off and having a good time? to get to that. Many people say that they want to be a Tiger Woods. Many people say that they want to be rich. Many people say that they want to do this or do that. But there's only a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of people who have been, had built into them through, usually through a parent like Tiger Woods' father, who have had it built into them, not only the discipline, but what it takes, what kind of dedication to get to those kind of heights. And I have tried my best to model what I'm doing with my kids. And that's not just baseball. It's with making good grades. It's with everything. My goal is very simple. My goal is, is by the time my kids get to high school, uh, to maybe junior in high school, every field that they ever walk out onto, I want, to, I want them to be able to say to themselves that they've hit somewhere between 50 and 100,000 more baseballs than anybody on either team on that field. That's been my goal from day one. And the reason it's been my goal is because of this right here. So many of you won't, many of you will not remember this, but Tiger Woods was on the Johnny Carson show and he was like two years old. Okay. These people were hitting golf balls from a very, very early age. And this is the pattern, but it's the, the prize doesn't go to, to the people who just hit some balls every now and then the prize goes to someone in that one in a million person, whether, whether it's trying to be a golfer or trying to be a baseball player or trying to be a doctor, the guy who does it more than anyone else and goes at it, not just every once in a while, but on a consistent basis over a long period of time and is willing to put it in and, and stick with it and never quit, never give up. And this is what brings me to the quote I've shown you many times on this channel. My favorite quote of all time. This is what it's all about, folks. No, it's from Calvin Coolidge. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Under Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan, press on, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. Now, m my sons are not even close to being the most naturally athletic kids on any baseball team they've been on. But one thing that I'm already seeing as a pattern is on almost every team that they're on, they hit for batting average better than, you know, different kids become athletic and, be and grow at different stages. But the one thing that I've seen that comes out and it comes out over and over and over is consistency. And the one word that takes you from one level to the next in any field is to be more consistent to the other guy. And the way you do that is you do it more, you do it more often, you do it more consistently. And over time, it all comes out in the numbers. And that's how you become successful right there. I'm going to finish with this quote from Billionaire Mindset. It's not the money I'm after. It's the freedom to live my life, to live life on my terms. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe and hit the like button and tell your friends and family. It's the freedom to live life on your terms that's important. Thanks for listening.